uh, finish this idea on, I mentioned before the break that um, the, the, the art of winning an interview. Um, uh, very often in any uh, life, by the way, I have students that say, I took your class and then I went to a job interview and I thought I was more engaging and I was better and I think I got the job because I knew how to conduct an interview. That's not necessarily what we're talking about here, but it does, it does have utility for any kind of a interview setting. The design is really that you're being interviewed by a reporter. And so how do you sit and hold yourself? But really it's in any setting, okay? Um, the uh, uh, idea of knowing logistics of an interview before you go into it. Too often what happens in politics, and I'll bet it happens to uh, uh, a lot of elected officials you know, is that someone will call the office. News, uh, newspaper, uh, a TV station calls the office and says, I want to interview the councilman. I want to interview the governor. And too often what happens is they say, oh, what's it on? Well, I want to talk about transportation. Okay, come on. Come on over or we'll come down to the studio. And they don't do the homework to find out how to make the setting the best setting it possibly can for the candidate. Um, so normally you want to, at the, at the outset of an interview, as a candidate, I want to find out who's doing the interview. Um, how long is the interview? Will, it, will my candidate be standing or will they be seated? Is there an interviewer or are they in a studio looking at a camera instead of, uh, uh, you know, there's a person off in a different studio and they're hearing through what they call an IFB, through the mic in their ear. Um, that's how they're hearing the questions. You want to know all of these logistics, okay? So, uh, who's the reporter? Is it a reporter that's friendly? Uh, very normally what I'll do is I'll say, okay, the reporter is um, uh, Marcos. I'll look and say, okay, I'll tell my press person, go find the last 15 or 20 stories that Marcos did. I want to know what he likes to talk about. I want to know uh, what motivates him. I want to know how tough he is if I've never uh, been interviewed by Marcos. And it, it allows for residual benefits. One, I get a flavor for who he is. He's tough. He's going to try to nail you. He repeats the question four times. So you answer the same way four times. Don't you leave, message, uh, uh, leave your message. Um, or it might be, oh, he likes to talk about the environment. Invariably, he asked an environmental question. Um, okay. Um, or maybe he did a great interview with Ricardo, the next president of Brazil. I want to be able to say, oh, by the way, Marcos, I saw that interview with Ricardo. Man, you were that was great. Why? I want to puff him up. I want to show him that I respect him. I, I watch his stuff. I, any little hint, any little thing that will give you an advantage to win the interview. Remember, we said this morning, any time you go into a communication setting, you want to leave as a winner. If all I'm doing is going into the interview and saying, oh, what's it on transportation? Okay, hi, what do you want to talk about? I'm doing a disservice. Um, every interview I have for a candidate, Every interview we set up, we do a practice interview. Oh, I'm going to talk to uh, this person about transportation. Um, all right, well, let's, let's do a mock interview. Policy person, give me some questions on transportation. We're going to do an interview. We're going to see what you know. How are you going to answer it if they ask this? We see that Marcos asks this same question every time about the environment. You better have a good answer for that one, right? The idea is just a little bit of homework is going to help you win. Too often in campaigns or in settings, we go into interviews and we don't get logistics. We don't find out the background, okay? It'll help you win the interview. Um, again, so you know the history of the medium. Is it a friendly newspaper? Is it a friendly radio station? Is it a friendly TV station? Are they hostile? Do they do fluff pieces? Do they do profiles? Or do they do hard-hitting news? Very different setting for the candidate or for the interviewee in that setting. Uh, how long is the interview? A 30-second interview? Much different in a 10-minute interview, okay? In 30 seconds, I better get my message in. I better repeat my message in 30 seconds. If my message is Barack Obama, it's change you can believe in. Well, uh, Senator Obama, uh, tell us about the campaign. Well, our campaign's about change. We think that America's on the wrong tra track, and we don't think we trust our government, so our campaign's about change you can believe in. In 20 or 30, I said change three times because I had 30 seconds. I want that in the story. If it's 10 minutes, a little harder, right? I can't say change, 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 right? But I want to keep coming back to that message. 
So here's what the campaign's about. Give a little, change comes into it. Give a little bit more, change comes into it. You want to try to control and keep on message. Why? And I get candidates a lot that'll say, I don't want to talk about change anymore. I'm going to throw up. I've mentioned the word change a thousand times today. And I'll say, yes, you have, to a thousand different people. You've heard yourself a thousand times, but those people haven't. So you have to stay on message. You spend a lot of money to develop that message. Um, but how long is it? Is it an hour interview? Much different than if it's a short one. Is it on camera? Is it live or is it taped? Okay, taped, a little better, less pressure. Sometimes I can control a taped one. We can stop. Oh, wait a minute, that, let's start over. I've had candidates do that. When it's live, you can't, oh, I said that. No, I didn't want to say that. Let's start over. It's already out there, okay? So you want to know all this stuff ahead of time. Will you have the questions? Do, do, do uh, Brazilian press ever give candidates questions ahead of time? Sometimes? Yeah, normally in places they will. If you don't ask, they probably won't. So normally, it's a routine for my press secretaries. Oh, by the way, what are you going to talk about? Oh, it's transportation. Do you have specific questions? Because, you know, I'd like to prepare the candidate. He'll, you know, he'll give you a better interview if he has a good sense of what you want. Oh, yeah, here's the five questions I'm going to ask. That is a gold mine. Now I have the five exact questions. Now we can really practice them and make sure you're given the absolute best answer. Okay? Um, if it's on camera, what's the setting? Is it studio? Am I in a studio? Am I in location somewhere? Uh, is it in an office? What's the best place to do an interview? Studio, location, or office? Anybody know? It's an easy one. Nope. Not normally. Location. Why lo location means if I'm doing an interview on educational issues. Let's go to a school. Let's get some kids in the background. I'm giving a, an interview on crime. Let's go to the prison. I want some woven wire in the back, background. The rule is people like a visual, right? People respond to a visual better. The news outlets like a visual better. So, oh, if we're going to, if we're doing education, instead of my sitting in an office and in a talking head, when people see talking heads on TV, they blank out. Oh, uh, they're some politician babbling. Oh, look at the kids. Where's, oh, there's a prison. What? He's at a prison. What's going on? Right? Location's normally better. Sometimes they'll say, no, come to the studio. If you can't, oh, you want to do it on education? Hey, do you want to go over to the school? The candidate's over at the grade school reading to, to second graders. Want to come over and cover that, get a little B-roll, a little background, and then we'll do the interview in front of the kids? Oh, it's a good idea. I like that. I had a rep reporter once. We were, we were doing talking head interviews, either in the office or behind a podium. And, and we went like five press conferences in a row, and they didn't cover us. They didn't put anything on the air. And I called the reporter, who was a friend. I got to know all of the reporters while I was doing press. And I said, by the way, are you mad at me? I said, we've done, you know, what? no, I'm not mad. What do you mean? Well, we've done five press conferences in a row, and you didn't put one of them on TV. And she said, well, I'll be honest with you. She said, I'm so sick of your guy doing talking head crap. She said, stand, every time you're in front of the flag, at a podium, she said, the, the public hates that. And I said, so what do you want us to do? She said, go to a location. You did one the other day on, on police issues. Why don't you go to a cop station or stand with cops somewhere or get in front of a cop car? I said, it's just the visual is important. So I said, are you telling me if I give you a visual every time you'll put it in the air? She said, well, I don't know about every time. I said, no, if I do a visual every time you put it in the air? She said, well, we'll put most of them on. We never did another interview that was in a studio. We always went to location and invariably, we got it on the news. Simple little rule, but it'll mean a lot. Um, it'll mean a lot. Okay. Um, can the interviewer vary from arranged questions? Yeah, I'm going to ask you these five things, and all of a sudden, they sneak up on you. Oh, by the way, Steve, yeah, I know I said these five education questions. Uh, Do you ever do drugs? That wasn't in the script, right? Normally, what ha that can happen, and you're going to have to answer it. If it, God knows if it's live. But normally, the relationship that your office will have with reporters is that if that happened to me, it'd allow me to come to that reporter and say, USOB, you bad person. You told me it was these five questions. I look like a fool to my boss. I trusted you. If you wanted to ask about drugs, ask about it. But tell me. Don't screw me like that. You want me to be honest with you, I am honest with you. Don't pull a stunt like that. I've done that many times in my career. Surprisingly, not that often. I've dealt with 
literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reporters, but I, and I've probably done that a dozen times. But I've probably dealt with reporters thousands of times. So it's not often, but you have that license. Wait a minute, we have a relationship. I'd tell you if, if my candidate wasn't going to answer something, what are you sneaking up a question like that? Don't do that. Um, at least have the courtesy to tell me. Will you be sitting or standing? Uh, we're going to come to that in a minute. I'll show you how you should sit and how you should stand for an interview. Um, okay, know the role of the reporter. Uh, what do you want to get out of the interview? What does the reporter want to get out of the interview? Okay? What do you normally want to get out of the interview? Very often your message, right? It's about education, but I'm going to go back, change my message. Well, here's why we need, we need education reform. Here's what's going on in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Here's the illiter illiteracy rate. Here's the dropout rate. We need change. I come back to change if that's my message. We need change for our kids because here's what's happening. So we're going to give them change if I'm elected. Keep coming back to your message no matter what the issue. Um, because very often, what does a reporter want out of the interview? Well, something salacious, uh, not necessarily, it could be dirty, but they want controversy. They, they want a story, they want to make news. They don't want you to say, well, I'm going to give you change, or going, oh, God, there goes jarting and change again. That's not news. He says it 10 times every sentence. So they're going to try to get you off that. Disciplined candidates will stay on it. Okay? Um, I did an interview with, with uh, Tim Russert, who was an American journalist who died, arguably was considered one of the best American journalist, did it at NBC's Sunday show. And I did a full hour with him one time. And Russert was considered very good for one simple reason. He would repeat the question over and over and just beat the hell out of you until he thought he could get, get you to answer it, if he thought you were dodging the question. So he'd say, well, Steve, what do you think about this? I'd give the answer. And he'd say, well, no. He said, here's what I asked. What do you think about Barack Obama's, you know, Obamacare legislation? Will it work? Is it too costly? Well, here's the problem, uh, uh, Tim. There's 125 million Americans that, that have pre-existing condition. They're going to get covered under that. There's 50 million Americans out of 310 don't have any insurance. Another 50 million. No, no, Steve, it's not what I asked. I said, do you think Obamacare is too costly? Well, Tim, uh, here's, here's what's going on in health. I said, how much is it going to cost, and is it too costly? You're not answering the question. And that's the way Tim would do it. And there's techniques you use. In order to stay on message, um, too often what do we end up doing? We take the bait. Oh, well, yes, Obamacare is too expensive. Oh, I just made news. I don't want to say that if I'm a Democrat um, and I get myself in trouble with the president and with potentially my constituents. There was a moment in the interview where I said for the fourth time, here's my position, Tim. He said, no, that's not the question. I said, Tim, I'm giving you an answer. You don't like the answer, but that's my answer. Uh, I respect that you don't like it, but that's my answer. And then it dropped and we went on. Um, the point is, sometimes good reporters are going to hammer you and hammer you and hammer you. Where campaigns get in trouble is when they think, okay, damn it, you asked it four times. All right, here's the answer. Obamacare is going to cost us a lot of money. Why would they do that? I just destroyed my campaign potential. The more disciplined you are, the more capacity to say, you have an agenda, so do they. I get their agenda. I respect their agenda doesn't mean I have to buy into it. I can't tell you how many candidates will say, oh, I'm doing an interview with so-and-so on transportation policy. Now, transportation, we don't want to talk about that. Right? We, it's going to cost a trillion dollars, and we don't have it, and you don't want to raise taxes to get it. Yeah, but he said he wants the interview to be on transportation. OK, but just because they want it doesn't mean that's what you answer. Well, what are you going to do about transportation? Well, here's the problem with transportation. In our budget, we don't allocate, there's too much corruption. We don't allocate resources properly. There's too, there's too much corruption. Here's what's happening, and contractors get whatever it is. No, no, but what are you going to do about transportation? I'm telling you. We have to close these loopholes where all this money's going, then we'll have resources. I'm not answering the question, but the public thinks I'm answering the question. I'm not asking you to be disingenuous. I'm asking you to be smart. Reporters oftentimes are going to take you down a, a road you don't want to be on. And I can't, it, it, look at how many times in the last two days we've talked about this one moment can kill a campaign. What we're trying to give you is another instance where a little bit of training can save your butt. You can run the most perfect campaign for 699 days out of 700. And the one day I go, all right, Obamacare is going to cost us a trillion dollars, we're going to go broke. Whoops. For 669 days, you were a rock star. One day, you lost it, 
and you lost the campaign. So this idea to be disciplined and having this kind of training to stay on message is hugely important. Okay. Um, again, sometimes your interests will c converge. The reporter wants what you want. Yeah. You have Mike. Uh, às vezes uh, existe o inusitado, né? Uh, no Brasil a gente, eu não sei se nos Estados Unidos tem, mas aqui a gente tem uma mídia que ela é sátira. Ela fica fazendo sátira sobre os problemas políticos, sobre os candidatos, e, e eles são chatos, e são bons. Uh, o que se faz? Se enfrenta essa mídia ou corre dessa mídia? Essa seria uma, uma dúvida que eu tenho. É uma grande pergunta. E, por favor, sim, nós fazemos na América. Infelizmente, para mim, nós não temos suficiente. I love satirical media. I used to write a satire column for a newspaper. Um, I, I, I don't think we do enough of it, but it's dangerous. Um, it's like we're going to come to, we're going to get into speeches here in a little bit, the humor myth. I can't tell you how many uh, uh, candidates will come to me and say, Steve, put some jokes in my speech. Make me funny. I say, no, you're dull. You ain't funny. I could put the best jokes in, and you ain't going to be funny, buddy, because you're just not. Um, what's a similar type of thing? Should I go on? A satirical show. This is normally the rule. If you go on and can't be self-effacing, can't laugh at yourself, if you go on and don't understand they are going to try to beat you to death, then don't go on. Because the flip side is, if you can go on and kind of be funny and self-effacing, people love that stuff. Love it. I wrote a, a book, in, a political book, in 2006. And it, I did Russert's show. Uh, uh, that's what the, his show was about, was this book. And... Um, Uh, before the Russert Show, it was the 1300th best-selling book in America. After his show, it went to the 42nd best-selling book. Russert had a big audience. When we left the studio, he said, uh, he said, thanks for the interview, this was great. He said, by the way, this will help your book sales. I said, oh, good, thank you. And he said, oh, but I don't say that arrogantly. He said, you get on Comedy Central, Jon Stewart, he said, you will go to the top of the, of the, the charts. Because people love satire, they love that humor. But going on Jon Stewart would have been dangerous because these guys make a living making fun of people. And so if you're, if you're not the type of personality or if you would get mad when they were making fun of you, uh, it's probably not a good show. If you have the disposition to go on and laugh at yourself, it can do you worlds of good. But it's dangerous, okay? So be careful. But, but again, I like them. I could go on and somebody said, you know, Steve, you're a politician. Um, uh, you know, what... Uh, how do you justify what's going on in Washington? I'd say I can't because they're all fools. If I can't say that and they all laugh with me, if I have to go, well, no, wait a minute, you shouldn't be picking on politicians. We're doing public service. We're doing what God intended. You know, stop it. You're, you just blew it and you made a fool of yourself. Okay? But, but everybody's different. The point is you have to judge. If you can do it, that's a pretty good forum. Yeah. Steve, só, só um breve relato como jornalista que já acompanhou, enfim, vários candidatos. Aqui no Brasil, você tem uma coisa muito interessante, que é o seguinte, é, você tem um grupo de repórteres que está sempre seguindo o candidato, independente de onde ele, de onde ele estiver. E, essa, e, e você tem dois perfis de candidatos, aquele que sempre para para falar com os repórteres e ganha a simpatia dos repórteres em função disso, afinal, eles foram para lá para ouvi-lo, né? não tem essa frustração de... É, do cara passar batido, enfim. E, por outro lado, esse cara está mais exposto a riscos de cometer um deslize, colocar uma frase mal feita, enfim. Né? E você tem também o, o, o candidato, é, é, ou, enfim, é personagem pública que, que não fala, que tem, por definição, por política, só falar em coletiva de imprensa ou em, em ocasiões mais, mais formais, é, e que tem uma certa antipatia por parte dos jornalistas, esses jornalistas que estão acompanhando ele no dia a dia, pela frustração relacionada ao fato de, de não conseguir falar com, com o candidato. Yeah, it's 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 a fine line. A lot of times, incumbents are treated, elected officials are treated differently than candidates. Ronald Reagan, when he was president, famously would have an issue of the day. I don't know if you remember this, um, but if I said if his issue of the day was crime, that I'm fighting crime. Mr. President, Mr. President, what about education? He'd say, we're talking about crime today. Next question. Mr. President, what about uh, Iran-Contra? Did you, did you uh, set up Ali North? 
We're just talking about crime today. Next question. And reporters finally go, well, damn it, I better ask a crime question or else I'm not going to have a story for tomorrow. And they hated it, but he got away with it because he was an incumbent. If you were a candidate and tried that, they would eat you alive. You better answer my questions or you'll never be the incumbent. What are you doing about this? So th there's no question there's a different standard between elected officials and um, uh, uh, challengers or candidates. I, I would offer this caution. Sometimes as the, as the challenger, it's one thing to be candid and the press loves you. Sometimes candor can hurt you though. The, oh, yeah, he gives a good interview. But the interview's so good you scare the public. He's always saying things kind of out there, right? It may be honest. Um, I think the simple rule is you always try to come back to your message. What are you doing about it? I'll, I'll answer a question about education. Here's what's going on in education. We know we got a problem here. Uh, here's our illiteracy rate. Uh, here's the dropout rate. But that's why I'm talking about change. We've got to change the system. We have to change the way we allocate funds. I can still come back to message and be credible. Um, I think you always want to do the best you can. And there is a pool report. America has the same thing. America does the same thing. Um, and they're following you around. And you know they'll get tired a little bit of, well, you keep saying change or whatever. But they understand it. They get used to it. Now, they may push you because they still want a different story. But they understand if you're disciplined. They're probably more mad at the incumbent who's arrogant and I'm the senator or the governor or the whatever. I can tell you what I want. Um, because you're probably more accessible than the governor or the senator or the president. So the simple rule is you still stick to your guns. Don't ever let a reporter dictate what your story is or you're probably going to get in trouble. Okay? That's the simple, simplest advice and it's pretty universal anywhere you go. Yeah. A minha pergunta é sobre que, que tipo de assessor de imprensa você consideraria ideal para um candidato. O primeiro seria aquele que um, tem uma atitude mais passiva e gerencia os pedidos já apresentados pela imprensa e te informa quais são os meios, qual é o objeto da entrevista e assim por diante. O segundo é um que tem uma atitude mais ativa e que cria oportunidades de entrevistas, entra no network com outros jornalistas para convencê-los a te entrevistar e assim amplia a sua oportunidade de acesso à mídia. Essa é a primeira pergunta. A segunda pergunta é, como você mencionou, muitos jornalistas estão interessados não apenas em saber a sua opinião, mas estão interessados num fato político, uma novidade que ele vai poder relatar no, no periódico ou no meio de comunicação em que ele trabalha. Você acha que o candidato deve se comportar de maneira a tentar criar fatos políticos para que amplie o espaço dele de participação, de entrevistas, de acesso à mídia, ou não? Can you give an example of political fact? What specifically? Uh, ele pode uh, visitar um determinado local e fazer uma crítica à gestão municipal, ou ele pode atacar um outro jornalista, ou aliás, atacar um outro candidato adversário dele, mas ter uma atitude mais ativa e não só comunicando a mensagem geral, mas tentando um, um, criar fatos que possam, que a gente já sabe que a imprensa está interessada em relatar. Uh, the, the, the answer clearly to the second is yes. The more you can animate, the more you can illustrate your point, the better off you, you're normally going to be. If by illustrating, though, you mean expanding it maybe beyond the scope of the message, or maybe now it becomes an attack, you don't want it to be an attack. You may want a third party to level that attack, but you don't want to necessarily be the attack dog, so stay within the confines of your message. That's why we started Yesterday, the second thing we talked about was message. You get that message, that's what's going to win. You've tested that. You've pulled that. You've focus grouped it. You know people love this message. I want to stick to that. If I start moving away from that, I could get in trouble because you could turn a story about education with a nice visual into you became the attack dog and now every time you know, you're viewed as somebody that, well, there he goes again. He's just beating the heck out of this guy. So always be careful. The simple rule. That is, and it's wonderful because it's easy to come back to. If you're ever in doubt, come back to your message. We're going to show you in a second how if you're asked a question you don't know the answer, how do you sound smart? How do I sound like, uh, I don't know? I don't, I don't want to give that answer. But we'll show you. But it's a similar, it's a similar proposition. And the first was... Uh, activist media system. Uh, activist media. And, and again, in what sense? So someone who is not only actually managing the request of the interview, but is actually you know, working at every 
So, eu estou repetindo a primeira pergunta. Um, um assistente de imprensa mais ativista, que vai atrás de outros jornalistas, que tenta convencê-los a fazer entrevista com você, que faz negociações de pautas, inclusive, você acha que isso é desejável ou isso é perigoso? Porque isso retira do candidato um certo controle sobre a maneira como ele vai comunicar a sua mensagem. E, de novo, você está falando sobre a campanha que vai e diz, sim, 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 eu entendo. Não, eu acho que isso é inteligente. I think that's smart. One of the things when we talk to, about press secretaries, the job of a press secretary, if my press secretaries are working 15 hours a day, I'll bet 10 of it at least is talking to reporters by design. I want them to go to lunch with a reporter. I want them to go to breakfast. I want them to go have a drink with them. I want them to go to dinner. I want to get them to know every reporter that covers my campaign and my opponent's campaign intimately. I want to, I want them to know about their family. When I did press, I did press in a couple campaigns. I knew what people drank, I knew what they ate, I knew how many kids they had, I knew where they went to college, I knew what religion they were, anything that I could make a connection, right? Because, and so then I could, and we used to call it planting seeds. I'd go with a reporter 10 months before an election. Oh, what's going on in the campaign? Oh, things are good, we're good, you know, working hard. Um, hey, did you hear this about our opponent? Plant a seed. We're off the record, we're having a private, you know. Oh, no, what is it? I don't know, there's something, you know, just think he made this vote and he's a hypocritical voter. There's some, people are talking about this issue. Planting seeds, planting doubt. That happens all the time, and I would encourage that. The, the, the easy answer to kind of, kind of this proactive um, uh, solicitation, uh, if you will, of journalists, I, I don't think you can do enough. In fact, I, we do something called a media run in my campaigns. Let's say you're running for... Uh, a governor of, of Sao Paulo, and there are, I don't know how many newspapers in the, in the entire state. If there's a hundred of them, my reporter is going to go to each one of those, my reporter, my uh, staffer, my press secretary is going to go to each one of those places and find out who the news reporter is and introduce himself, who the editor is, introduce themselves, who the reporters who are covering the campaign, introduce themselves. They're going to go to every radio station, do the same thing. I want, it, I want those reporters to put a face to my staff. Um, I want them to have a friendship because we're going to get better press. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example. I, I did a campaign in 1988 and my job was to go get to know the media. And I did. I, I went and had lunches with them. I drank with them. I ate food I hated, but they liked it so I act like I liked it. Um, but I got to know them. Um, and w there was a a moment in a campaign where we were trying to get a story planted and no one would pick it up. And I called a friend of mine at one of the major uh, daily papers and said, why aren't you covering this? And she said, well, you know, we need more information. I said, no, you don't. I said, damn it, it's out there. This is a big deal. And she said, are you telling me I should write a story? I said, yes, I'm telling you to write a story. This, we have done our work. And it was something, our opponent had done something that was illegal, and they wanted us to hold a press conference to say it. And I said, no, we didn't do anything illegal. They did, and you're not printing it. You have a responsibility. And I couldn't say that if I didn't know this report. And she said, all right. She printed a story. This is how bad it was. She printed a story, headline was something about our opponent involved in criminal activity. As soon as it was printed, we put it in a TV ad. <laughs> and she called and said, you used me to get an ad? I said, I didn't use you. You, you must have thought it was worth writing the story, you wouldn't have done it. Now, I goaded you into writing it, but our opponent did a criminal act. That's news. Of course we used it. You didn't think we were going to use that? Okay. But you get the idea. I, did, I got to know, again, doing these media runs to a radio uh, reporter. This is horrible, but um, we went out to lunch, and he was drinking this, the, the most rot gut, awful gin that ever made at lunch. And he was just drink after drink. So I have a drink. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is just horrible. Uh, but, and so at one point, and he's about half drunk, and, and I said, by the way, when our opponent sent, this was back when you still sent press releases through a fax. Now, of course, they're emailed. Uh, this was in the 80s as well. I said, when our opponent sends you a press release, um, uh, would you mind turn around, fax them to me, and if you do, I'll, I'll send you a bottle of this really fine scotch you drink here. Uh, uh, you know, I'll do that every week. I don't remember what I was. He said, yeah, I'll do that. You don't have to send me any scotch. I said, no, I'll send you some scotch. It's $3 a bottle. 
<laughs> you make it in the basement, I don't know, it was horrible. We got, we got our opponent's press releases back then now, because this was their fax, and so they don't show up till the next day. We got them before they were ever in the newspaper. So we could respond to her attacks before they were technically even leveled. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, the point of all this is, yes, you want to get to know the media. You want to be proactive. You want to talk about stories. If my press office staff isn't going out to reporters and schmoozing them and trying to get them to write stories, we got a problem, OK? So it's a big deal. OK, um, let's see. Uh, Steve, yeah. posso só entrando, eu tenho uma certa ah, eu tenho uma certa dúvida quanto essa provocação com a imprensa para ter a sua imagem, né? para passar a sua mensagem. Um assessor de imprensa ele se baseia através de release, através desse contato com os jornalistas, mas muitas vezes é intimidado pelo, pelo, outro, pelo seu opositor a não fazer publicações. Na noite passada, você colocou as redes sociais como um meio Acredito que YouTube, Facebook, você uh, criando fatos e explorando as redes como forma de também forçar que a mídia impressa e rádio e TV publiquem a sua fala, é um meio. Eu queria saber. Só que, ao mesmo tempo, a imprensa também ela quer informações privilegiadas. Quando você toca isso nas mídias sociais, você acaba com, as, com o privilégio das informações. Então, qual que é o meio adequado do candidato que não tem o, o poder econômico da eleição né, para manter a sua, sua visibilidade nas mídias, seria a utilização somente das mídias sociais? Eu queria esse questionamento. Sim, yeah, it's well, uh, here's the danger. Um, uh, and this happens a lot, where you'll get someone will say, give me an exclusive. You give me a story about when you're announcing. Give me the story and I'll put it in the front page, but I want an exclusive. What happens to all the other members of the media when I give them an exclusive? They get upset. And so it's a, dang it's a slippery slope to be on. It, you, know, you may want to give it to everybody. Now, but what about social media? Um, social media has taken on a life of its own. Social media finds things out, right? I mean, there are, there are people that are bloggers that hear gossip just as fast as a reporter does. Now, as a campaign, I know that maybe I don't want to give it to a reporter. I want it to come through social media. If it shows up in social media, I can say, these guys have their own sources. I might have been one of them. Um, but maybe that's the avenue I want to, uh, want to. I mean, Barack Obama announced his presidential campaign through social media. Um, he wasn't, I'm sure every, every network in America said, you give me, I want your announcement first, and we'll put you at top of the news. We'll put you on 60 Minutes on CBS. We'll put you. It was like, I'm not going to, if I do one, I'm going to upset all of them. So he leaked it out to social media by design, wasn't an accident, and did it that way. The point, though, about social media is social media is driving mainstream news. Don't think that it isn't. Every reporter I know in America looks at all the political blogs because they don't want to get scooped. And so you put something out on, on, in social media, it's out there. It's going to get picked up by the mainstream press almost assuredly. That's a big plus for a campaign. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I used this yesterday, this macaca, this senator that we got on tapes calling a, a kid of color, an Indian American, oh, you macaca, you, uh, and he said, welcome to America. We couldn't get mainstream media to pick it up. They thought we doctored it. We put it on YouTube. Mainstream media, all of them. Next day, it was all over America. So uh, it's another vehicle to me. Mainstream media doesn't necessarily like the social media. But they're real. They're, they're out there. They do have sources. I can't tell you how many people will call me, in a, a blogger, and say, I got this. And a reporter didn't call me. The blogger knew it before the reporters did. So it's another vehicle to use, and I would use it. Um, the key, though, is you want these guys to be your friends. You want to be credible with the media. So I tell them all the time, here's the deal, guys. I'll never lie to you. I won't screw you. I, I won't always give you what you want, but I won't lie to you. I will tell, if you say, Steve, what's your candidate saying this? I may say, I'm not going to go down that road. I'm not, we're not going to get into that. But I'm not going to say, oh, no, we're fine, or we didn't do that when we did. And we have that understanding. You set those ground rules. Because I know them all face to face, we've become friends. Um, uh, we have that rapport and that credibility. 
So I would, I would in my press offices, or if I'm running for governor of Sao Paulo, I want my press person to know all the members of the press personally. I want them to know all the, the news editors who assign stories. I want them to know the media. That's their job, okay? All right, yeah. yeah. No, it's really interesting what you're saying, and it's really true that you have to keep the media closed and create this relationship, but at the same time, journalists, good or bad, are always looking for a story. So my question is, can you really trust the media? Well, it's, okay, here's the, here's the rule. I, I don't think it's in here. It's in the longer one. The question, can you trust the media? They're always looking for a story. We have one rule. How many people, you've all heard of this, right? On the record, off the record, or on background? On the record means, it's on the record. Anything I say, you can print it, run it, use it. Uh, off the record means off the record. You can't print this, you can't talk about it, uh, nothing. On background means, you can talk about it, you just can't use my name. Those are kind of the three rules in the journalistic community with regard to comment, no comment. The rule is nothing's off the record, okay? Nothing's off the record. Because here's, ha here's what happens. I say, well, is this off the record? Yes. Okay, well, here's, here's what our opponent did, had an affair, and our opponent is uh, uh, on cocaine right now, driving down the highway. Uh, go pick him up at the stop sign. Well, that reporter, as soon as the phone hangs up, they're going to go, Jardin just told me the guy's doing drugs. He's out in the highway, right? It's never off the record. Now, the flip slide is what happens. I'll tell somebody it's off the record knowing that it's going to go on the record because I want it to go on the record. I just don't want it to come from me. I've done that to reporters. I'll, I'll say, they'll say, Jardin, can you tell me this? And I'll say, no, because if you say it's off the record or you say a Democratic consultant told me, I'm the only one that knows, so everybody will know it's me. So you have to find some other source, or, and invariably they'll say, um, you know, a source from this area so it looks like it's not me to protect me. But the simple rule is everything's on the record. It's just how you use it, okay? Uh, so be careful with it. But it's a very good point, yeah. Journalists want stories, I get it. I mean, I'm okay with that. But that doesn't mean I have to play into it. Doesn't mean I have to give them the story. I don't want to make news unless it's the news I want to make, yeah. É, professor, rapidamente, só a título de curiosidade em relação ao, ao que a Gisele perguntou, aqui no Brasil, uma estratégia muito utilizada pelos assessores de imprensa, tanto em campanha quanto nos governos, é, em relação a essa questão de exclusividade, é você é, é passar uma parte da notícia para os colunistas... Você escolhe um colunista e passa uma... Olha, o governo vai anunciar tal coisa, ou o candidato vai anunciar uma nova coisa, enfim. Você passa para um colunista, esse colunista publica, e no dia seguinte toda a imprensa vai querer saber, e aí você responde para a imprensa de maneira geral. Uma, é uma técnica já há vários anos utilizada pelos assessores de imprensa aqui de, de política no Brasil. I kind of like it. Uh, it's, you're kind of getting a two-day story out of one. I think it's innovative and smart. Uh, I'm going to steal it and use it in other places now. Uh, I've never done that, but I like the idea. Um, it's a great idea. Um, give a little bit of news and come back and give a little bit more, and now all of a sudden I turn a one-day story into a three-day story. Okay. I think it's smart. I'm okay with that. Journalists may not like it. Oh, come on. Give me more. Give me more. What do you, you know, there's more than this, right? Well, no, it's all, it's all we're talking about. Okay. All right. Um, Taking control of the interview. Um, we talked about this. Uh, uh, how do you uh, uh, handle your message? The simple rule is, and we do this every, before every interview, I, t I ask the, the candidate, what, what headline do you want in the paper tomorrow? Whatever headline you want, that's what you should be talking about. If I want the headline to be jarting tough on crime, I better give an interview that suggests I'm tough on crime. right? And I better talk about crime, not 15 other things, or the journalist has 15 things to choose from for that headline. Discipline on message is going to win campaigns. If you're not disciplined and you answer every question a reporter asks, you're going to lose the campaign. You're not going to have a consistent message. You're going to be all over the map. I know it sounds like we're orchestrating, and it sounds like we're trying to control the message uh, 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 extensively. It's only because we are, okay? I want you to be disciplined. The more undisciplined you are, the more you're going to get in trouble. It goes back to your point. Reporters want to make news. It's not news if I stay on message. 
They want me to say, okay, Obama's health care thing is bad. It's going to cost money. Whoops. I don't want to go down that road, whether I believe it or not. Okay. Um, uh, some of this is self-evident. If you want to enhance a point, sometimes use an illustration or a story. We're going to come to stories and speech making here in a minute. Um, everything you sh say should restate and reinforce your message. That's what I was talking about earlier. Oh, what about crime? Well, here's what we're doing on crime. We don't have enough resources because the budget's out of whack and, that, and my, my message is about to, the government wastes money. So I come back to that. That's the reason we can't deal with crime. What about education? Well, education needs cash. Why don't we have cash? The government's corrupt. They're stealing the money. You know, it all comes back to message. It doesn't matter what the question is. Reporters may fight you on it, but they're not your audience, folks. Your audience is the people listening to it. And if every time you open your mouth, you're saying something that suggests a new message and it's not consistent, if Barack Obama didn't use the word change every time he did an interview, 10 times in that interview, he never would have been the candidate who, Amer if, when, when you asked Americans, give me one word about Barack Obama, by the end of that campaign, 9 out of 10 voting Americans would say he's about change. That showed you he won the message war. Right? Think of that. What, what do you, what, what, what would, how would you describe Obama? Well, he's that guy that said he'd give us change. Yep, that's it. Bingo, you win, Obama. Right? That wouldn't have happened if he wasn't disciplined on message. Do you have a... Uma dúvida do ponto de vista prático, ainda dentro dessa ideia de relacionamento né, com a imprensa e também construção da mensagem. O que, que a gente deve fazer, enquanto assessor de imprensa, quando um jornalista é meio que nos coage, nos constrange a dar algum dado, a fornecer algum dado, a gente não quer. Vou dar um exemplo prático que me aconteceu, eu trabalho com isso. Me aconteceu essa semana, acho que há três dias ou quatro dias, um jornalista de um, do maior jornal lá do, do meu estado, o Ceará, é, pediu um dado e um, alguma coisa do governo, do estado, e a gente estava em duro se passaria aquilo ou não. O cara falou, ó, oh, se você não me der esse dado, eu vou falar na matéria que você não quer me dar esse dado. Vou falar lá que o governo do estado não quer dar o dado. Quer dizer, seria péssimo do ponto de vista político, né? Que, que seria contra a questão de transparência e tudo mais. Então, a gente optou por divulgar parte dos dados, realmente, para poder... É, é, queria saber o que, é que a gente deve fazer. né? Então, ele, ele meio que constrangeu, falou claramente... Que, que ia dizer no corpo da matéria que o governo se recusou a fornecer aqueles dados, a gente avaliou que não era conveniente, e aí optamos por divulgar a parte deles. Mas em outras situações, então foi, foi tratado tranquilo, enfim. Mas em outras situações, como a gente deve agir, agir no caso? É aceitar o desgaste de sair uma coisa dessa ou, ou teria alguma outra forma de conduzir isso? Yeah, não, é uma grande pergunta. É uma pergunta difícil. E eu diria que você tem que levar o caso case por case. Você tem que dizer quem é a news organization. Are they friendly or are they not? If they're friendly, you might say, listen, we don't, you're, not gonna, you're, gonna, you're blackmailing us, really? That's what you do? That's how you want to get news? Uh, I, come on, we're not going to, you want to print it, print it. Could have been one option. You, you, said, you chose to leak something out. It sounds like it worked for you. But you don't know. Every situation is different. It, what if they're hostile? A lot of times, if they're hostile, what might you do? They're not a friendly press. And they say, if you don't tell me this, we're going we're gonna to run with this story. What might you do? They're hostile. They don't like you. Everybody knows they don't like you. You might tell them to go to hell. Run the story. You run it. I'm going to deny it. Everybody knows you hate me. Everybody knows you're biased. Everybody knows you rip me every day. So, oh, you're threatening me? Oh, I'm going to rip you? Oh, welcome to a new day. Now, you want a relationship with me? Let's start talking. But I don't have relationships with blackmailers. Um, I don't like them. I mean, sometimes, I've been that tough with press. Sometimes you have to. And I, I deal with hostile press all the time. But sometimes, I, it, now, if they're friendly, I'm not going to have that attitude. I'm going to say, really? That's what you guys have become? Come on. Not gonna, I'm going to talk to your publisher. <laughs> you know? Is that what you're doing? Does your editor condone this? You guys actually think blackmail is what's going to get you what you want? Uh, we've been good to you. We give you stories. We're not, we don't, you know, that kind of thing. Every situation is different. It happens. You have to deal with it, and you make a decision. Um, sometimes, and, and there's, a, there's a, in fact, we, it's in one of the classes that teaches a, there's a, a book on attack the messenger. Uh, in America, 
in not just in America, but certainly in America in the last generation, so it's become very formidable to attack the messenger. Um, the example was uh, uh, Dan, uh, Dan Rather from CBS News was considered a Democrat and Republicans didn't like it. So George H.W. Bush goes on and does an interview with Dan Rather so that he could say, Dan Rather, you're biased, you're liberal, you're horrible, and he walked off the stage. Did it on purpose. So he could look tough to the media. Ooh, did you see H.W. Bush? He told Dan Rather where to go, and the conservatives loved it. He, did, he, he, he knew Dan Rather wasn't going to give him a good story, so he thought, I'll, I'll burn the bridge, I don't care. Uh, Democrats do it with Fox News all the time. They'll say, I won't go on Fox News. Why? Because you guys burn me all the time. Republicans very often don't go on MSNBC in America. Why? Because MSNBC's reporters are very liberal. Okay? But it really is case by case. So it sounds like you handled it pretty well. But there's no hard, fast rule. It's who are they? You know, what's our relationship? Where, what, what do we want our relationship to be moving forward? OK, let me get to this. Um, uh, you can see some of these. Uh, well, this one I want to come to, and then I'm going to, I'm going to show you the, the proper stance and, and for seating and standing. What if you don't know an answer? Somebody asks you a question. Steve, what do you think about X? How do you respond to that? The, the, the easy answer is don't make it up. If you don't know, you don't know. Don't try to bull your way through it. Oh, what's Medicare Part D? Well, it's... Uh, it's, it's it, Medicare Part H, Y, Z, I don't want, there is no H, Y, Z. Don't make it up. You're going to destroy yourself. Sometimes you have to say, I don't know. What, what are you asking again? Oh, but I'm not familiar with that. Let me find out and I'll get back to you. Much better than saying something stupid. Okay? Then there's some techniques. Um, I talked about this a little bit the other day. Instead of just saying, I don't know, there, I can't say that eight questions in a row. So maybe I say, what about, you said Medicare Part D? I'm not entirely sure where you, what you're talking about there, but let me tell you what I do think about health care in America. Or here, what, what you're talking about, what uh, funds for transportation here in Sao Paulo? I'm not entirely sure what you're doing with that budget, but let me give you my position on transportation in Sao Paulo. That's a transition phrase. Studies show, even though Marcos may not like it because I dodged a question, when, when viewers see that, they think I answered it. Oh, well, transportation, well, let me tell you what I know about trans, I didn't ask you a question, but I, but I segued, I transitioned to my message. Here's what I know about, and I go back to my message, okay? And studies show that when people see that, they're like, okay, this will catch you. You guys that won't run for office, it scares you. Here's its simple trick. You're, you're going to get asked questions you don't know sometimes. Sometimes you can just say, I'm not sure about that. Tell me again, what are you asking? Oh, I'm not sure, I'll get back to you, it's a good question. But you can't use that 10 times. You can use these quite a few times. OK, you want to talk about transportation? Let me give you a big picture. I don't ask the specifics. I don't know it. But I don't say I don't know it every time. So no, let me be clear about my position on transportation. And I give the answer, OK? Um, it's called blocking and bridging. I block a question I don't like, and I bridge normally to my message, to something I do want to say. These are. These are some of the most common and are used all over the world. Everywhere I go in the world, I hear politicians say these. Um, what's that question? Well, let me tell you what's most important here to the Romanian economy. It's not what I asked. That's what they say. Oh, you want to know uh, what uh, uh, about genocide in, uh, in Bosnia? Well, here's another thing that you should remember about what happened in that war. And I shift to a different thing. I don't answer the question about genocide. I don't want to answer the question about genocide. So I block it and I bridge to something else. And, and these are transitions. Well, what, you want that on transportation? Well, transportation is not my area of expertise, but I'll tell you what I do know. We got too much traffic and so, you know, whatever it is. Okay? They're transitions. They get you out of trouble. Too often, when you ask a question you don't know, you look like the deer in the head. Oh, God, I don't know. What should I say? What should I say? What should... In those three or four seconds, you lost it. People watch it and go, wow, he's an idiot. He didn't know a thing. In that instant, you want to be able to, again. Or here's another one. Steve, what do you think about this? What I've said is very clear. And then you go to your message. And I don't answer the question. I had a, a candidate, we did training once, and we said, you're going to go on this Sunday show, and they're going to ask you about taxes. Because you said you wouldn't raise taxes, and you did. First question. 
was, you raised taxes and you said you weren't going to. We had a prepared response, and he said, essentially this second to last one. Um, he said, here's what I've said. In the Commonwealth, blah, 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 we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. I did all that. And then he said, we went to the public and asked, and the public said, through referendum, we, should, we could raise taxes. He gave his answer, and it worked. They didn't come back and say, wait a minute, you didn't answer the question. You campaigned saying you wouldn't raise them, and you did. It was good enough. The reporter let him go with it. Another one, again, you should keep these in mind. If you ever get in trouble, find a transition and get off it. Don't let a question destroy your candidacy. Yes. A regra de justificar antes de responder é a mais correta, porque numa situação dessas, para o ouvinte, ele não fica... Ele, ele não está preparado no que o repórter te questionou. Ele está preocupado com a tua resposta. Então, se você... Na minha visão, sempre a regra foi... Não, eu não quero responder para o repórter. Eu quero responder para quem está me ouvindo. E eu tenho que passar a mensagem que eu quero. Então, muitas vezes, a, quest... a pergunta dele seja sobre transporte. Não necessariamente eu vou responder o que ele quer. Mas eu vou falar de algo que é, na minha campanha, eficiente sobre a área do transporte, que vai chamar a atenção do eleitor. Então, o que me deixa preocupada aqui é a justificativa no início da resposta, porque eu não tenho que me justificar. Eu estou me comunicando com o eleitor. Eu posso retirar a justificativa? Well, yes, I think so, depending on the situation, because again, you you have to be steely focused on this message. Um, I don't want to get in trouble with a question that I either can't or don't want to answer. I don't want to answer whether Barack Obama's health care plan is going to cost money if I think it's going to cost money and the American public doesn't want it. So, um, no, I think you have license to go to your message. All these tr techniques do is so you don't look like you're, oh, uh, 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 and I've lost it. So, so the idea that in, in a moment's notice, and we literally will have candidates memorize some of those. Well, here's what I have said, or uh, let me be clear, you know, those kind of things. Because that also buys them a second to segue to their message. But, but the bottom line is, I think you're okay. I think just you go to that message. Because studies show when you show clips of, of candidates saying this or elected officials, oh, you asked about transportation? Let me be real clear about my record on transportation. And I tell you my record on transportation, I ignore the question. When you show voters that, they all think I answered the question. Literally, it's virtually 100% think, yeah, he, that was a good answer. No, it wasn't. I avoided the question. Um, but I didn't get in trouble, OK? Um, OK, um, flagging is a, is a segue. That's in your notes. Let's come to this, uh, the, the interview. Uh, who wants to be interviewed? Um, you want to be interviewed? Come on, pull a chair up. You there? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm closed. <laughs> I'm closed, he said. Testing. No, what was that like this? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. How do you sit for an interview? Okay. How was he sitting to start? He even did this, right? And then you said, oops, I'm closed. You were closed. Don't do that. Never have your butt forward when you're doing a seated interview. What happens to your shoulders? It's like, yeah, baby, I'm, a, you know, I'm sitting in my living room. Nope, I'm doing an interview. Not sitting in my living room. The simple rule is either you, you sit with your butt in the center of the chair, lean slightly forward, or the easiest rule is butt goes to the back of the chair. When I butt's at the back, it naturally leans my, my shoulders forward, and I can't slump. I, I couldn't slump here if I tried. My butt's too far back. Here I can, I can slump here, but when I got my butt to the back, it lifts my shoulders. Lean slightly forward, what do you do with your feet? His feet are here now. Is that the way to have it? No, uh, feet come here. There you go, one ahead of the other, just like that. Because again, you don't want anything that relaxes you. You want to be, okay, right here. Keep the shoulders up. That's the position. Yeah, and, and slightly forward, not back, not too far forward, but just slightly forward. Okay, what do you do with your hands? 
Okay, he's got a handheld mic, so in this case, he would have to use that mic. But let's say you have a lavalier. Up, up here? Yeah. Oh, we're coming up here. Yeah. All right, have a, have a chair. Hmm? This is worth. This is worth. <laughs> okay, similar though, now it's a little different though. It's a chair with arms. Okay? Still, what do you do? Keep your butt back, lean forward slightly, okay? Keep the eye contact. Remember we talked about that? How are you doing? Oh, you're, the, you're the governor of Sao Paulo. How are things in Sao Paulo today? Good. The transportation is awesome. Transportation is awesome. <laughs> Yeah. So how long have you been a liar? Uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Notice he looked away, though. Keep your eye contact. That whole answer, don't look away. When the audience sees that, they're like, and, and we talked about it this morning. Oh, transportation? You looked away? They're going to say, I think he's lying. He, transportation bothers you. So again, butt back. So the posture now, shoulders up. Hands normally in your lap. Don't put them on the arm. That's, that relaxes you. Normally, you keep them in your lap. It's easier to gesture that way. Let me tell you about transportation here in Sao Paulo. Right here. In, remember we talked about the TV box? I'm not flailing out here. It's right here, real natural, okay? Don't keep them down here. Don't keep them here. If you have arms on a chair, it's just like a podium. It can become a crutch. I'm nervous, so I grab this, and I don't gesture, right? So keep it relaxed. Keep it right here. Another thing. I'm, okay, uh, normally I would say, can I move my chair? If I were you, you want to look me in the eye without having to turn sideways. So shift your chair a little bit. Normally they'll allow you to do it. All right, so now my butt's back, my feet, one foot ahead of the other, hands in lap. Um, tell me about tr the transportation, what are you doing for, to solve the transportation problem in Sao Paulo today? <laughs> Ro no, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> okay. So apparently you're doing nothing, uh, Governor. Clear about okay. this uh, yeah. okay. Yes, make up an answer. I <laughs> <laughs> you should do some real uh, new. Uh, Thank you. So go ahead, uh, Governor. Uh, tell us uh, about your transportation uh, uh, solution. O problema do trânsito em São Paulo é realmente complicado, mas acho que temos que fazer novas estradas e modificar. Don't look away from me. Keep looking at me. Keep the eye contact. Okay? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. Yeah. yeah. Because remember, normally we look away. Right? It's creepy to look at somebody. When you do an interview, you got to keep the eye contact. Every time you look away, you lose the audience. Okay? I know it's hard, but just go with it. Okay? A lot of times, reporters will be looking down for the next question, so it's not as creepy as it feels. But in an interview, you've got to do it. I can't stress enough. When, when people see it on camera, they see your eyes looking away, and they think you're lying. Uh, uh, tell me about, uh, there was a photo in the... Uh, uh, the newspaper this morning about uh, uh, apparently you were at a brothel last night with a prostitute and you were doing drugs. Uh, uh, I do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, you, were, you were doing that. Um, all right. This exercise is more about the posture, yeah. okay? But see what we're talking about? What you don't want to do is butt up and relax. It droops the shoulders. It's disrespectful. The audience thinks you're disrespecting them. Um, so the easy, keep it up, keep the shoulders up, all right? Uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, by the way, for women, uh, you absolutely have to cross your, your uh, feet at the ankle. Men, you can keep your legs apart. Uh, women, you can't do it. Obviously, if you're wearing a skirt or something, you, you don't want to do it. Even, but even with slacks, cross your feet is the simple rule. There's a media trainer called uh, Chris Jenke in the U.S. that does primarily women candidates. She's terrific. Um, she has a book out on being a, a, a woman candidate that I would recommend to anybody. It's a terrific book. Um, but the same principle applies to women. Again, butt back, shoulders up a little bit, keep the hands right here. Okay? That's the idea for, okay, now let's do a, a standing uh, interview. Come on, you can stand and do one. How do you stand to do an interview? And let's not use the mic for now. Let's just get to positioning. All right, so uh, camera's on, and I'm, I'm the interviewer, you're the candidate. How do you stand? How do you stand? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> That's right. He, He's obviously in shape, and he's going to reach across and punch me in the face here in any minute. Uh, okay, first of all, nope, one foot ahead of the other, exactly. Not here, not here. It's a little imposing, so a little bit here. Feet f fairly close together, um, one slightly ahead of the other, okay? What about his hands? His hands are here. He's a strong guy. He's, he's, I don't want to be here if I'm a muscular guy. I'm not. He is. Okay, what should he do with his hands? Right here, exactly. You can cl clasp them this way. Clasp them this way, but keep them right in front of you. Easy to retrieve. Well, here's what we're, here's what we're doing about transportation. It's a problem, but we've been working our, you know, right here. Keep the hands right here. A little bit forward. Not too much, and again, watch the space, but you don't want to be back. So leaning forward a little bit, one foot ahead of the other. Very relaxed, okay? Um, but hands here, all right? Always keep the eye contact. Don't look away, all right? Simple rules. It's amazing how many times, you'll see candidates do interviews, and they're, they're doing this, or... They're this. Nope. It looks bad on camera. And by the way, again, every one of these has been tested repeatedly. And people, OK, if I'm relaxed, I'm here. Hands here. Um, never hands in pockets. Never here. Don't put hands down here. They're harder to retrieve here. Keep them at your waist. Right here. Right here. OK? All right, thank you. Nice job. <laughs> All right. Again, those are simple rules, but you're going to do a ton of interviews. I've had uh, students say, okay, and I'm doing, a, I'm doing an interview for a job. Same principle applies. Pull your chair up, my butt's back, I'm leaning forward. Hi, it's good to be here. I smile, I make eye contact. I'm asking, God, how long have you been here with Microsoft? It's a great company. Oh, I see a picture of your kids. Oh, you got two kids. Man, they're beautiful. Right? You're making a conversation. Well, too often, we do a job interview. Yes, I've been at the company a year. I really want this job. What are you doing? I wouldn't hire you. <laughs> it's like, wow, what's the matter? Lighten up, right? It should be conversational. And we do media training for, for uh, employees for job interviews, and it, the same principles apply. Sit up straight, be alert, be warm, be friendly, smile a lot. One of the things we didn't get to between questions, what should you do? What happens a lot of times, and they call it a cutaway, so we're doing an interview, and while I'm asking the question, they come to you, right? The camera comes on you. You're not answering yet, but it's called a cutaway. And one thing you shouldn't do is too much of this, right? I do too much of that when I do interviews. I catch myself. And so you got to kind of keep the head still, maybe a bob a little bit, OK? All right? Not, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So you don't do that. But you also. You're always on camera. So, oh, I'm off camera. I don't relax. I have to stay. Keep the eye contact. Keep the hands. Uh-huh. Whatever it is. You're always on camera. OK? Um, and, and it happens a lot in cutaways, where you'll see people looking down. They're looking at their watch, or they're playing. Yeah, and you look silly. When, you, when the camera's on, you should figure you're on camera. OK? And so you'll do that. Same thing if you're seated, the same, same principle. But the idea is that you do relax. The one thing you should do, not, not bob your head, what else should you do uh, when, the, when the interviewer is asking the question uh, and the camera might be on you? What should you be doing? Yeah. Well, paying attention. Pay attention. Don't go, you know. Don't roll your eyes. You know? uh, but what should you be doing? Very often. You're asking me, OK, so you're the interviewer. Ask me a question. How, how's trans transportation? Uh, we, th we think we have it under control. We think here's what's going on. This initiative is going to take care of it. We're going to have an underground subway. It's only a trillion dollars. Uh, the public voted for it, and, and they love it. Okay, now he's asking a second question. What should I be doing? He's asking. Camera could be on him, but they could do a cutaway to me. I should smile. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Right? Smile. Why be, right? Uh, so always... Anytime you have an opportunity to be warm, it's like when you give a speech. At the end of a speech, how many of you say, uh, and so it was great to be here, good night, and you walk away? Why do you hear politicians go, thank you, thank you, God bless Brazil, God bless Sao Paulo? Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Because they really want God, bless, God to bless Sao Paulo or Brazil? They might, but that's not why they do it. Because at the end of a speech, just like the beginning,
Good evening. Thanks for coming out. It's great to be here. Uh, terrific uh, crowd. It's a, it's a Saturday night. I know you could be a million places, but you're here. Thank you very much. I want you to see my smile and my eye contact. Same thing. Thank you. God bless Brazil. What happened? The smile comes back. The eye contact. Thank you. It's great to be here. God love. God bless Sao Paulo. God bless Brazil. I want you to look at my smile. That's the last thing I want you to see. I don't really care for God to bless anybody. <laughs> okay, that's, that's what I'm really saying. Right? I'm leaving a last impression. Right? Too often. How many times have we seen it? A guy says, and that's why we're fighting tonight for Brazil. Thank you and good night. And they walk away. No, 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 don't do that. Thank you, yes, yes. I'm friendly, I'm likable. Right, that's why you hear it. And you hear it all the time, politicians. Thank you, I don't necessarily like this. Sometimes, you know, politicians will do, some of that's okay, but you're just showing energy. You're showing this smile and, uh, and your likability again. Okay, any questions on those simple little techniques? That's all, I mean, literally, one foot ahead of the other, keep your hands in front, keep the shoulders back, Lean slightly, that's it. Standing interview, that's what you do. Oh, when the camera's off, nod a little bit, smile. Those are the media training rules, they're that simple. Don't vary from them. When you're seated, one foot ahead of the other, butt back, shoulders up, same thing, hands in your lap and I use them. Simple rules. Amazing how many of you, when you do interviews, I've done interviews where, where guys literally had their legs spread and they're sitting like this. Don't do that, right? I mean, you're not in your living room. You're not in by the pool or whatever, wherever you spread your legs like that. You're in a, an interview. It's professional. None of those are hard. Do them every time. Okay? All right. Any questions on any of that? All right. I want. Uh, yes. É uma outra dúvida. É, e com relação, você falou agora há pouco sobre a questão do posicionamento. E aí eu quero saber com relação à questão do olhar para a câmera. Qual o modo mais adequado para você passar mais segurança? Por exemplo, a TV Globo, que é a TV maior aqui do país, eles têm um, um, um direcionamento, quando eles, eles vão orientar o um entrevistado, pede que você não olhe, normalmente, salvo grandes autoridades, governador, ministro, enfim. Mas, normalmente, o um entrevistado não deve olhar para a câmera, senão eles nem põem no ar, normalmente a regra é essa. Mas, nas outras TVs, TVs locais, regionais, enfim, você tem essa maior liberdade. Agora, o que é melhor? É ficar olhando, a câmera está aqui, eu fico respondendo para quem me perguntou, ou aquela história de olhar? Tem gente que fica aqui e fala com o outro, olha, olha, olha. Eu, eu, pessoalmente, acho que isso é, é terrível. Assim. Tem gente que não sabe para onde olha, né? quer aparecer, quer quer mostrar o belo sorriso, e aí não sabe. Eu, particularmente, acho que é, talvez seja mais eficiente você, para dar uma entonação, né? por exemplo, nós estamos trabalhando, não sei o quê, mas para beneficiar as pessoas. Então, eu, eu, particularmente, acho, será que esse é o modo mais correto? Será que é melhor a gente olhar só para o repórter, no caso, ou, ou ficar... Qual o jeito aí de passar mais segurança? Obrigado por perguntar a pergunta. Eu teria sido remiss se eu não lembrasse. É muito vital e importante, e há uma simples regra. When somebody's interviewing you, you look at the interviewer. You never look at the camera. You never look at the camera. Why? So let's, let's, let's say the camera's over here. You're doing the interview. So you say to me, what about transportation in Sao Paulo? What about transportation? Well, let me tell you about tra <laughs> The public sees that and they're going, what the hell is he looking at him for? That's rude, right? The, let the camera come to you as a rule. The camera very often is on a swivel. I'm going to keep the eye contact. If they don't want this angle, they'll swivel over and they'll get me here. You never turn to the camera. I, you see it all the time on, on, uh, uh, on, on news stations. Somebody will go, yeah, and they go to, and it's like, no, and, it, and it's embarrassing. They look to the camera. The simple rule, and I'm glad you asked it because it, it's in here, but I might not have got to it. You never, ever look at the camera. You, it, you, it's rude. You're doing an interview, I got to look at you. The camera will find you. You don't find the camera, okay? Because you will look silly. Um, and I don't know, what'd you say? They said they don't want you to look at the camera? Yes, they it don't. They're right. You always look at the interviewer. And, but it's a good question because we, we're not certain. If we've never done an interview, oh, should, should I look over here? No, keep the conversation. Talk to the person. Let the camera find you. Yes. É... Qual é a tua opinião sobre o uso das novas tecnologias, inclusive para entrevista? Skype, 
é, Tweetcam, sei lá, daqui a pouco eu vou entrevistar via WhatsApp. Qual é a tendência e você já tem técnicas preparadas para essas entrevistas dinâmicas e né, que deve ser bem diferente? Yeah, another good question. There's, they're not necessarily new techniques; they're the same techniques. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're doing a, I'm stuck here. If you're doing a a uh, Skype interview, no different than if I'm in a studio looking at the camera and the the reporters in another building or you know and they're doing it via satellite, I look straight into the camera because t the TV audience thinks I'm looking at you. They don't know that you're not necessarily in the room. So. Instead of, in, you know, do I look down? Do I, no, look right into the camera the whole time. The same premise on Skype or if you do a blog cast, some sort of, and I've done a bunch, wh where's the camera? I look into the camera. Again, in that case, there's nobody sitting there, right? If there is holding a camera, I look at them. I, I don't, uh, the camera finds me, but if it's just a camera and the person doing the interviews on a remote location, I look into the camera. That's the same for Skype. It's the same for podcasting. It's the same for... Uh, the same rules apply, okay? Person in the room, I look at them, let the camera come to me. If it's just a camera, I look into the camera, okay? And that applies to all this new media as well. Okay, um, I want to shift, where, where are we at on time? Oh, a question, sorry. Jorge Luiz, eh, ainda sobre essa questão da da entrevista, do comportamento né, diante de câmeras e do entrevistador. Mas, assim, e na situação de um debate, né, você vai estar em um auditório, né, tem a plateia, é, os candidatos, citar um exemplo como eu participei o ano passado, todos nós estávamos sentados, candidatos, né, e a cada tempo destinado a, a cada candidato, a gente tinha que se comportar. E aí, no meu caso mesmo, teve momentos que eu levantei, né, circulei, mas teve momentos que eu fiquei também sentado, sem ter, dizer assim, uma certa orientação técnica de como se comportar diante disso aí. E, no caso do debate, ter também, ser um debate transmitido por televisão. Né, como é esse comportamento de estar olhando para onde, pra, enfim... Yeah, uh, again, a good question. We have a whole section on debates uh, that I don't know that we're going to get to all of it. You'll have it in your notes, though. Um, and like I say, I do debate training. I've done them for presidential candidates. I've done them uh, for years, and I teach it at Harvard. Uh, and there are very, very strict kind of guidelines for that. First of all, um, you determine ahead of time what the, what the rules are. You should always do that. You asked, can I stand? Should I stand? I don't know. You should find that out. What if everybody's seated? There was a famous debate in the U.S. where Bill Clinton debated George H.W. Bush. And George, the question was on uh, poverty. And George W. Bush, they were on stools. And he got off the stool and kind of came toward the questioner. And it was, it was a question on, do you understand what it's like to be poor, Mr. President? And Bush uh, kind of, what are you saying? I don't know. And he, and he fumbled the question. And then he kind of got standoffish. This was the one where he famously looked at his watch first, like, I don't want to be here. Um, and, and then he went and kind of sat back down, and he never really answered. And you could see Clinton just salivating because he couldn't wait. Um, so Clinton, and it was a young African-American woman who asked it, Clinton gets off his stool, he walks right up to her, and he says, are you telling me you do, you And he was right there, and he said, I'll tell you what poverty means to me. I know, and that's what I was talking about. And he was right, and it was, it, when that clip was tested in America, it's why Clinton won the election. It was a dead heat race. America said, this guy cares. He went right up, and he was right there, and he said, I, you know, I fight for you. Um, and that was the difference. So the, but the point was, Clinton knew he could leave the, the stool, or if he didn't, he did it anyway, and nobody protested, and went right into the audience, essentially. Uh, Bush did not. He looked standoffish. He looked weak. Um, the first rule is find out what you can do. The, 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 the next, if this, everybody's different, um, but normally I like to come into the audience. I like to come to the edge of the stage. Why? Makes you look warmer, more human, right? Oh, I'm back here in the stage, right? Um, and I stay in my chair, or my opponents stay in their chair, but I know I can get up. Let them sit down and act like, like they don't care. I'm going to come out here. 
I'm going to come and say, let's talk. I want to get closer to you. Um, but sometimes it'll depend what the camera angles are and all this stuff. So you need to determine the logistics ahead of time. And normally your staff would do that. Okay, it's a debate. Are we all seated? Are we in chairs? Are we behind podiums? Are we on stools? Is there a coffee table? Do we have water? Do, can we bring props? Is there a cutaway camera? So when I'm done speaking and, and you're speaking, could another camera come on me? Um, I need to know all those things. And we have a, we call them Harvard rules, but we have a, a list of rules for debates that I'll, it's, it's probably in the packet already, but you'll, you can get those, I'll show you those. And literally go through that checklist, all these things before you debate. And a lot of times what happens, your opponents won't negotiate debate logistics, you'll be the only one doing it. I've done it in America a lot, where I'll say, okay, we need to do this, we need to do that, we want to be seated, we want to be here, and they say, okay, our opponents didn't even ask for anything. Um, I'll give you an, an easy example. We had um, a, a candidate that was about medium height, and we wanted podiums. We wanted him to look more senatorial, um, look bigger. He'd look bigger behind a podium. Okay? Our opponent was very tall, very big man. Our, my candidate wasn't so big. As it turned out, the, our podium elevated to the height of our candidate, our opponent's podium did not, so he was hunched over the whole debate, and it looked horrible. We negotiated the size of those podiums. His campaign didn't think to do that. Simple little thing, he looked horrible. Another one, we had a US flag waving in the wind behind us at an open air uh, debate. Our opponent didn't negotiate a flag behind his podium, so through the debate, we have a US flag rippling behind our candidate, the image of God bless America, and our opponent's hunched over a stage with no flag behind. Um, that's what I'm talking about. So uh, take a look at that section on, on all the things you should negotiate. The simple rule, though, it's kind of like there's nothing off the record. You're always on camera. You're always on camera, okay? Um, so uh, the, 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 the techniques here, um, we're not done. This, like I say, this is a section that I teach uh, for a whole semester. And we go through these, and we go through these, and we go through these. Oh, okay, we want to look at the video. But anyway, please take a look at this. This is the idea of media training. All the things we've talked about, practice those techniques. Practice changing up the pauses and the voice. Practice the gestures. As I said this morning, I can think of maybe a half a dozen gestures. That's it. There's not 500 of them. It's to the heart. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's here. There's not a bunch. Open hands like that. There's four or five. But mix them up. Use them. Change that voice up. Show that passion and energy. We're going to talk about speeches, not today. I'll start with that tomorrow, and then I want to get into the field. Um, but the great speechwriters of the world will tell you, tell a story when you give a speech. Why should you tell a story? Because I know the story. I can get animated. I can get emotional about a story. Let me tell you a story about my mom. Oh, it's your mom. Everybody comes in, right? Um, I told you the story about, about my dad dying. And mom said, you know... They put your head in the pillow. That gets, I, I can give a speech where I'll give 100 statistics, and I'll be pounding the podium. It's a 30-minute speech, and afterward, people line up and say, I love the story about your mom. That's what they remember. Stories are big, OK? We'll talk about that tomorrow. But the idea is you always want to connect. Use these techniques you've been taught. Your opponents aren't going to have these, folks. They're not getting media training. So take these. Film yourself. Take a look at it. Then go back and say, I didn't mix up each sentence. Every five or six words, I'm going to try that. I'm going to change my voice. I'm going to come down. I'm going to give a pause and start working them in. And pretty soon, you're going to be a very good speaker. You just are, like I say, if I wish we could have the time to film you at the beginning and film you at the end, you'll be stunned at the progress. OK, we're going to look at a video. Eu não admito qualquer insinuação, incluindo o meu nome em qualquer atitude ou atividade de terceiros, sobretudo porque é dito e sabido que eu não tenho nada a ver com isso. Segundo a Receita Federal, o senhor foi convidado a prestar esclarecimentos sobre a Operação Uruguai, não respondeu e seria julgado a revelia. É uma mentira da Receita Federal. É uma mentira da Receita Federal. Mentira da Receita Federal. Três vezes dizendo que é mentira. Em nenhum momento deixei de comparecer com os meus advogados a qualquer determinação, a qualquer inquirição da, da, da Receita Federal ou de qualquer outra instância do poder. Agora, com relação a essas últimas denúncias, a Receita Federal e a Polícia Federal dizem que vão voltar a investigar o senhor. Não dizem coisa nenhuma. Ainda denúncias. hoje, o, o ministro da Justiça, uma, uma voz sensata, que afinal aparece 
nesta seara de, 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 de podridão em que se transformou esse governo no sentido da perseguição política a um cidadão, o ministro da Justiça, numa voz sensata, determinou e disse que nenhuma autoridade vinculada ao seu ministério poderia especular ou muito menos citar o ex-presidente Collor em relação a qualquer das denúncias que estavam sendo feitas, ou denúncias não, especulações que estavam sendo feitas via, via, pela imprensa e por algumas outras subalternas figuras da estrutura do poder em Brasília. É uma voz sensata que aparece, porque não se pode fazer uma especulação em torno da dignidade e da honra de quem quer que seja. Seja essa pessoa quem for, isso é um absurdo o que está sendo feito. Como é que o senhor vê o fato de a Polícia Federal decidir hoje reabrir o inquérito sobre a morte de Paulo César Farias? Uh, a Polícia Federal reabre o inquérito em relação ao que ela quiser. Eu não tenho nada a ver com isso. O senhor tinha conhecimento de que o seu tesoureiro de campanha tinha contato... Não tinha nenhum italiana? tipo de conhecimento, isso aí é preciso também que se veja. A máfia italiana, ele está morto, ele está morto e sepultado. E essa vinculação que querem fazer em relação a ele, de máfia italiana, é outra fantasia, é um devaneio, é um sonho de uma noite de verão. Porque todos sabem também como isso se deu. A imprensa publica, mas em outros, nos esconsos das páginas uh, uh, policiais, e não colocam isso onde deveria ser colocado. Esse, esse suposto uh, vinculação dele com a questão do que dizem seu a máfia foi num período específico de 93, a no, de 93 uh, durante o ano de 93, quando ele se evadiu do país e que teve que utilizar um tal de um doleiro, que dito isso já investigado já dito, e já colocado isso claramente, mas infelizmente não divulgado para a, a ciência de todos. E que esse doleiro estaria usando, esse, utilizou também dinheiro de outros que estariam vinculados a uma suposta máfia. Isso é um absurdo que estão querendo fazer, vinculação com qualquer coisa de narcotráfico, qualquer tipo de máfia. É um absurdo e que eu também tenho que repelir, não sou advogado dele, não tenho mandato da... da, da da família dele, nem muito menos dos seus familiares, mas tenho que me insurgir contra mais esta injustiça que está surgindo. É, eu vou citar alguns nomes que foram citados nessas investigações relativas à máfia italiana. Eu gostaria que o senhor me dissesse se conhece essas pessoas. Oswaldo La Sálvia. Não conheço. Luiz Felipe Rica. Não conheço, não conheço nenhum e deles. um italiano chamado Ângelo Zanetti. Mas não precisa, você pode relacionar aí os 200 ou o que vocês quiserem. Eu não conheço. Não conheço, nunca tive com nenhum deles, nem sei da existência deles. Quer dizer, e essa, por que perguntar a mim se eu conheço esses, esses camaradas? Por quê? Por que eu teria que conhecê-lo? Por que eu teria que ter alguma vinculação com qualquer tipo de máfia? Eu sou um presidente da república. Eu fui julgado como nenhum homem já foi julgado neste país. E inocentado pela mais alta corte de justiça do meu país. O que eu posso exigir agora é um certo respeito, pelo menos ao meu padecimento e ao meu sofrimento. Não conheço nenhuma dessas figuras e não tenho nenhuma relação a ver com máfia de qualquer tipo que seja. Nem máfia de autoridades, nem muito menos máfia que tem sotaque. O senhor disse numa, numa nota oficial que é candidato em 98? Senhor... Nota oficial? Numa, então, numa nota sua. Você está inteiramente desinformada, minha filha. Filhotinha, você está desinformada. Eu nunca disse que sou candidato em 98. O que eu disse é que serei novamente candidato. Quando a oportunidade aparecer, eu novamente colocarei o meu nome à disposição da opinião pública e da população do meu país para ser julgado pela voz das urnas. Foi isso que eu falei, minha filha. Não foi a respeito de 98 e 2002? É, a partir de que momento o senhor considera que suas relações com o seu tesoureiro de campanha, PC Faria, se encerraram? E é preciso se estabelecer muito bem isso. Se fala com tesoureiro de campanha em 1993, em 1993 não havia campanha, em 1993 não havia tesoureiro, em 1993 eu nem na presidência estava. Não aceito esse tipo de vinculação? Não aceito esse tipo de lação? Repudio esta pergunta. Até porque as relações minhas com o senhor Paulo César Farias estão nos autos, busque os autos, procure nos autos e vai ver lá o que está escrito e colocado. Após tomar posse na presidência da república, o senhor manteve algum tipo de relação com o senhor Paulo César Farias? Mas minha filha, você está perguntando coisas que já foram respondidas 10, 15, 20 vezes. Estão lá, está lá no processo todas as vezes em que eu estive com o senhor Paulo César Farias, antes e durante a campanha eleitoral. Procure no processo, tenha um pouco de trabalho e vá buscar e responda a sua curiosidade. E depois da campanha eleitoral? Responda a sua curiosidade, busque no seu processo. Estou lá todas as vezes em que eu estive. Os processos dizem que o senhor, que um carro Fiat Alba, que pertence ao senhor e que a, re, a reforma dos jardins da, da sua Minha residência filha, oficial, você está Jardim, ressuscitando coisas pelo... que já foram... Minha filha, isso é um absurdo, esse tipo de pergunta. 
Isso tudo já foi julgado. Dois anos isso tudo foi investigado. Pelo amor de Deus, quer dizer, será que todos aqueles que estão nos ouvindo neste momento já não estão cansados de ouvir este tema e de saber que isso já foi pisado e repisado e explicado e esclarecido e que levou a Suprema Corte do país, depois de tudo que foi levado, a minha absolvição em relação a essas acusações? O que você está querendo fazer? Exumar? Exumação? Eu não aceito. Eu estou fazendo perguntas com relação às questões que estão sendo levantadas. Mas não estão sendo levantadas, Brasil, foram julgadas. Isso é matéria julgada. Isso é matéria julgada. Você não está aqui de boa fé, minha filha. Você não está de boa fé. As suas perguntas não são de boa fé. As suas perguntas estão viciadas. Estão evadas de má, má, má fé. E eu não posso aceitar uma coisa dessa? Eu não posso me dispor a uma situação como essa? Isso tudo já foi... Repito, como todos sabem, visto e julgado. O que é que vocês querem mais? Como é que o senhor vê a possibilidade de a Receita Federal voltar a investigar o senhor, como tem Mas sido... Mas não há nenhum Dito, motivo, né? nem, não há nenhum motivo, nem nenhuma justificativa plausível para que minha vida seja mais uma vez investigada? São só mentiras que são sacadas. A última mentira veio disfarçada de fonte. Essa mentira vem disfarçada com sotaque. Quantas mentiras mais vão assacar contra mim? A única esperança que eu tenho e a única, a única coisa em que, graças a Deus, eu me fio, é que a verdade não é filha da autoridade. A verdade é filha do tempo. E nada melhor do que o tempo para desmascarar essas mentiras, desarmar estes circos que são armados, como este agora, em relação a esse episódio, Uh, que querem envolver o meu nome, tudo isso naturalmente cortina de fumaça para toldar. Ah, uh, did you want? Oh, oh, first of all, I need to go shower uh, after that. Uh, uh, actually, it's a great video uh, for an illustration that is a cardinal rule in politics, and he violated it uh, throughout. What? O que não fazer? Um exemplo do que não fazer. Of what? Yes, of what not to do. What did he do that you never do in politics? You don't get angry. You get indignant, but you don't get angry. There's a fine line, but it's a big difference. When the public, I mean, this man was, I, I literally wanted to stand behind you because uh, I thought he was going to come out of the screen and, and uh, you know, beat me up, right? Even when he was done, he'd sit back, you know? It's like, whoa, slow down, right? Be indignant. Almost belittle the reporter. There you go again. I've answered this. The people of Brazil are tired of it. This has been investigated. Why are you doing this? So I've answered it. Instead, I'll tell you why, whoa, whoa, whoa. <coughs> I guarantee if you focus group that, people of Brazil would be afraid of this guy. Right? Anger doesn't work anywhere. You can be, remember the Bill Clinton, I did not have sex? That, he wasn't angry. He was indignant. Let me be clear. I did not have ind Indignation is different than anger. This guy was angry. Even when he, I mean, and it went on forever. Right? Maybe initially you're indignant. Let me be really cl clear. I've answered these questions. A judge ruled there was nothing to them. Then she asked it a second time. I don't know what else I can say. I've answered. Okay, now you come down a notch. He went up a notch. He got angry as the interview went on. And it's hard to look at that and not think, you're almost too angry, buddy. You're almost like you're covering something up here. Always stay in control, which is another rule in politics. Don't get angry. He was out of control. There were moments where he looked at that reporter like, I'm going to reach across the table. Right? The public sees that and says, I don't, want to, I don't want my president to be out of control. What are you doing? Plus, it was a woman reporter. How did the women in the room feel? A little, little violent there, buddy? Treating a woman with a little disrespect there, maybe, Mr. President? Right? Maybe 
if he would have said, used her name. I don't know her name. He never used it that I, I couldn't tell, but right, if he'd have said, Michelle, you've asked that question five times. I've given you my answer. Brazil knows the answer. They're tired of this. And then notice, he didn't take after her, he took after the journalist community. What, do you want to piss off every journalist? It's one thing to say, why do you guys do that? It's only here at Channel 7. You repeat this over and over again. It's not news, folks. Instead, he says, you journalists, you all suck, right? No, don't take after the journalist community, right? It's, sometimes it's okay to beat up that member a little bit if that's your strategy, although I wouldn't do it by being mean. He could have he done it by initially he's indignant, and then all of a sudden he's almost disappointed. Well, there you go again. You've asked that. What do you want me to say? I, I mean, it's, it's been ruled on. You think the people of Brazil want to hear this over and over again? They're tired of it just like I am. You can't give it up. Be disappointed. Right? I mean, everything about that interview was, was not good. His body language was horrible. His eyes. He, if I were training him, I'd say, you got to blink, buddy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? I mean, it looked like something out of a, out of a Damien movie, you know, I mean, he's gonna, it's the devil or something. No, you know, back off. Warm up a little bit. And I'm not, I'm not belittling him, he's probably a great guy, maybe he's a friend of some of you guys. But if I were doing media training, I would say, what are you doing here? You're gonna destroy yourself. Way too hot. Way too tough on that woman reporter. Way too angry. Right? Let's practice this. I'll bet he didn't do media training before he went in there and somebody said, whoa, you're going to get asked these tough questions. How are you going to answer them? Are you going to do this? I'll doubt he was trained to do that. There's a way, to, and by the way, if you're going to give that interview, that's what you wanted? That's the headline you wanted? President looks like devil on Channel 7. Right? You don't want that. you know, he, he, during this, this interview, he was not for a, a president anymore. This was after the fact he was yeah, thinking around five, it. Yeah. Five years. But even that, if he wanted another career, you don't do that. Okay? Steve, uh, just to make a comment, you know, like, what are we up against? What are we going to face? A guy like Collor, this guy, after his quarantine was over, after his impeachment, he got elected as a senator in his state. And not by coincidence, his state has the highest homicide rates in Brazil. Okay. Well, I would bet he didn't get elected because of this interview, right? He may get elected for a lot of reasons. But again, these rules are pretty uniform. Don't get angry. The public virtually anywhere, and it makes sense. We don't want our, our presidents to be madmen. We want them to always be in control, right? You can be indignant a little bit, but we want you to be in control. And so once you initially do, they listen, I've answered that question, and you know I've answered that question. This is what happened, bam, bam, bam. They ask it again, there you go again, change your tone, okay? Don't treat that woman with disrespect, the reporter. Steve. Yes. Uh, we have just watched the Clinton video, the 15, 20 seconds. Oh. Would you mind to show that? No, not just at all. Contrast that yeah, with color? yeah, put it up. This is the I did not have sex video? Okay. And remember, this video you're about to see, Bill Clinton had been impeached by the U United States House of Representatives. Uh, the U.S. Senate was about to take, they were <laughs> under U.S. Constitution, literally serves as a jury and could vote to, in this case, uh, uh, remove President Clinton from office. So he was already impeached. That's the first formal step. So Clinton, knowing that the Senate was debating, should we go? The Senate did not have to. It was their choice. Do we take this up and essentially try the President of the United States? Right? And the charge was that he lied, uh, that he lied under oath in this investigation about whether he had sex with Monica Lewinsky, this intern. So the Senate's debating this, and his staff said, you better go on TV and convince the American public you did not have sex with this woman. Because if they think you did, and the Senate decides to go to, to try this, you're, the odds are pretty good you're going to lose your presidency. They'll probably convict you. So he, this moment, he had to go. This was, weirdly, by the way, he did this at uh, uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I think it was. Why did he do it at 1 o'clock in the afternoon? Why not do it at 8 o'clock at night after people are off work? 
Who watches TV at 1 o'clock in the afternoon? Housewives, senior citizens. His staff knew if you can't convince women, you're done, buddy. Right? If the women of America think, I'm not sure he did it, then maybe you survive. If the women say, that SOB, you know, get rid of him. So it was not an accident. He did this in the afternoon when little old ladies that are retired are sitting at home watching in America, which they still do, soap operas. I don't know if they have such a thing in Brazil. And a lot of mothers are home with children. So he did it when he knew that would be the audience. Okay, look at how in control he is. This is indignant. Notice how the, president of Bra the former president of Brazil was angry. This is indignation, big, big difference. Notice the background here too. Notice the setting behind Clinton. What's the setting remind you of? Huh? Like presidential. I want to be president. Let me get back to work, he'll say at the end of this. Not an accident. Exactly, That's all, it's, uh, I'm at the White House where I'm president. Let me be president. Knock this stuff up. We've had enough of this, America. I didn't do it. Look at his eyes, folks. He but I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told him it's a lie. Not a single time. Never. These allegations are false. And I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. What do you think? Much different. Same, same type of deal. The president, he, he was ready to lose his job. He was ready to go to trial, and the Senate likely would have convicted him, thrown him out. Instead, he looks, first of all, he looks a little shaken, a little ashen. I don't think that was an accident. I'm tired of this. I'm upset by this, but not angry. And, and then the eyes. Let me be real clear, and the eyes squint. Notice how the head was tilted down and the eyes were looking a little bit up. And then he does the point. I did not have sexual relations. First it was, let me tell you one more time. Like, America, this is it. I've told you, I've not done it, and they're playing games. I'm trying to be president. See the presidential look behind me? Uh, and then it's the, the squint of the eyes. He looks up. I didn't let me get back to work. And then he walks off and looks sad. And by the way, there was an audience. And what did they do? They pl applauded. An accident? No. He wanted the American public to think, so people watching at home went, oh, he was applauded. Okay, must not have done. I like to say, I wa we were watching at a restaurant. I thought, oh my God, this is going to be great. What's, is Clinton going to survive or not? And he did it, and I turned to the person next to me. I said, maybe he didn't do it. I thought he did it. <laughs> I thought he was guilty as hell. But wow, that was pretty convincing. Again, was not angry. He was indignant. It's a big, big difference. He saved a presidency, and I, I would argue that the, the former president, that he didn't help himself there. So uh, th this is what we talk about with media training. This moment saved a presidency, another one may have done it. You're going to have those moments in your career. I want you to win every one. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.